Yeah, actually, I read an article about Yerji Hayacek in a magazine back in 2006, and he had just been awarded the Magnesia Litera Prize for uh, this novel, which was chosen as the uh, uh, best novel in 2005 in the Czech Republic. And uh, I got the book, gave it to my uh, wife who read it, and passed it around to her mother and her father, and her aunts read it. We all agreed that it was quite an interesting uh, um, book, and uh, I got in touch with, uh, or my wife and I got in touch with uh, Yerji Hayacek's um, uh, agent, and then with Mr. Hayacek himself, and uh, it uh, developed from there. Could you just tell us briefly what it's about, just so people know? Yeah, it's, um, well, it's sort of a uh, historical detective story with a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a love story mixed in with it. And it's about history and it's about archaeology and um, it's a, a, a little bit um, about uh, architecture. But uh, uh, it's about a professional genealogist who's uh, searching uh, uh, people's uh, histories, their family histories, and he gets started in a, a very kind of special uh, uh, project that turns into a sort of mystery story. And it takes us back to the 1950s when the agriculture was collectivized here, which is a very ugly period in, uh, in the villages, and also looks uh, a bit at uh, things that were going on in the 1990s with the restitution of property. And uh, it, it gives us some insight as to um, you know, how all this affects people even to this day. Okay, so it's something which, you know, if you are interested in this society and this culture and why checks are like they are, uh, this would be, I think, a very interesting book to, to read to give you some idea of this. Uh, in fact, I'd like to ask you, could you just read us two or three pages of it to get a feel of what it's like? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to do that. I think I'll just start at the, uh, start at the beginning and uh, read the historic section. Um, the book starts out as just a little bit of a, a setup. Um, the, uh, this first scene, if you will, of the book is occurring in Chebone. Those of you who have been to Chebone uh, may remember that there's a castle there, and there's a rather large uh, park um, out uh, or alongside the castle. And our main character in the book, uh, um, Pavel Stranyansky, is uh, sitting on a park bench there and is uh, having a meeting with a rather dodgy character uh, named Shramik. And so I'll just read a few words. Oh, for God's sake, not this miserable place again. I just thought to myself and sighed. The sun was searing through the thin green leaves, and the crown of the linden tree above was humming with summer. Tourists, exhausted by the scorching heat, were plodding along the footpaths in the park, heading to the castle gate. Mr. Shramik sat beside me on the bench and just kept talking. I was looking forward to being within the coolness of those stone walls nearby, in the weirdly pallid light of the research room, the muffled rustling of archival documents, the musty odor exuded by old books. A man has to pull every word out of you, he said. You shouldn't have come here again, I answered. But you know these villages, these people. For you, it's just a matter of a few days. You said so yourself. So why don't you want to do it all of a sudden? I don't get it. I was flip, flipping through the files he had given me, only in order to put this torrid and unpleasant interlude behind me. A few newspaper clippings, sheets torn from some yellowed brochure, copied pages of official documents. I repeated to myself the name of the village, and then the three family names, one after another. Yirka. Kubach, Majanik, yes, of course, Majanik. It's house number 11, two gabled farmstead on the square, well kept up. And across the way there's that ruin that used to be a farmhouse with a vaulted gate, and it has a two-story granary. A part of it's been knocked down and the cooperative farm stores some machinery there. The barn's about to fall in too. They call it the Yurka Place. And the Kubach farm, I don't remember exactly just now. 
I can see that you have it all in here, Shramik said, tapping his head, his plump face brightening. Mainly in here, I replied, rapping with my knuckle of my index finger on the laptop computer in the black case. Mr. Stranyansky, it's certainly somewhere at those farmsteads. We don't know where, but you'll find it. Someone may have it in some old shed around there, maybe in Chernohorka. I don't know. People used to keep such things. The old folks still come and sit about on the village squares there. Tomashitsa. Chernohurka, Smirchi, I said, pronouncing the names of the villages out loud. It's like a swirl in a kettle, those farmhouses, surnames, godparents, christenings. I had a few jobs from over that way some time ago. I think I even wrote about those farmhouses. But that was many years ago. Those villages are dying out, Mr. Shramik. He bent his shaven pink face toward me. He was around 50 his hair already turning gray, wide suspenders on his light summer shirt with short sleeves, chubby arms. I tell you it's a letter. It's there somewhere that much we know. Maybe there's even more documents. At the village hall, at the rectory, I don't know. You're the expert. You may find there's a whole pile of papers in some cupboard or in an attic. He lowered his voice a bit more. And then? It would be a straightforward swap, Mr. Sternonsky. Just as I told you, papers to me, money to you. The sun was right above the Chebone Castle. I was kicking at the bench with my heel, and my thirst was pleading for me to get out of there. It was difficult to swallow. I was thinking about the open spaces above and beyond the fields back home, about water and shade. But now I was in this pressure cooker. Shramik was prodding me to decide, to agree, and his hot, unpleasant shadow was pushing me into a place where I did not at all want to go. You know what? You should find somebody else. Mr. Stranyansky, these things happened years ago. Who knows for how long that woman is already dead? There's no danger for you. I got up and stretched my back. He stood up too sweat on his forehead, wet spots on his shirt. I handed him the things. Keep it, Mr. Starnansky. I'm going back again through Injiku Fradis on Friday. I'll come by. And he immediately carried on as if I had said nothing at all. Here at one o'clock? I was looking at the half-dry grass. It's a deal, he said after a while. In fact, speaking just to himself. If you're not here, I'll come by and ring for you at the archive. And where does it go from there? <laughs>